All right, welcome one and all. Uh, it is Sunday. It is a pleasure to have you all with us. Um, we are joined once again by a friend of the pod, Mary Taylor, um, from her idyllic uh, Connecticut estate. That looks like a, a stone fireplace behind you. Is that a Zoom no, background or is that an honest to God stone fireplace? Hurt. Oh, wow. It's just, it's just a furnace, but uh, I wish I had an in-house fireplace. I don't. Okay, well, it looks it looks like must be the guest. What's that? It looks very appropriate, um, given yes, that you're coming us from, from New England. Uh, we're thrilled to have you back, hmm. Mary, and we're thrilled to talk about uh, the wines of the Southern uh, Rhone here. Um, for all of you uh, joining us today, thank you first and foremost for taking uh, the time uh, out of your Sunday uh, to make this a part of your uh, week. Um, we have all sorts of options. First and foremost, uh, we're going to be discussing um, Mary Taylor's uh, very own Costier Vim. Uh, Costier um, essentially refers to the coast uh, surrounding uh, the uh, ancient uh, city of Nîmes, and uh, Mary's going to talk a little bit about the history thereof, but it has been a center of winemaking for uh, several thousand years. It doesn't get um, you know, the column inches of oh, its exactly neighbors that. like Chateauneuf or Gigondas, but uh, it is every bit as noble and every bit in its own way uh, capable of producing uh, profoundly uh, delicious wines. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the giants of the region for the sake of Chateauneuf, um, but focus a little more on the lesser known lights, the Gigondas, the Baccarat, the Vaucluse um, of the world. Um, and that's very consistent uh, with Mary's approach because she loves the wines of the old world, uh, but more often than not finds those forgotten corners, um, you know, that produce wines that punch well above their weight and uh, offer the kind of value that you can't find in the more famous corners of the continent. Um, so I'm going to give folks a couple more minutes uh, to join us here before we uh, start in on the actual program. Uh, we have a bunch of wines in the mix. As I mentioned, um, we have uh, Costier de Nîmes. Um, and that's from uh, an individual grower, uh, Pierre Vidal, uh, bottled under Mary Taylor's label. Um, we have a white uh, accompanying from the same village, from the same Appalachian coast here, uh, from a good friend of ours, actually, um, uh, Michel Gassier. Um, his uh, family, uh, part of his family, his son resides uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, literally a stone's throw away from the restaurant. Um, he and his wife, uh, who's an American, have been here and uh, I uh, wanted to shine a light on what he's doing uh, as well as a fun foil uh, for Mary's wine. And then uh, we have a flight of four um, from some of the most storied producers and, um, you know, most notable corners of the Southern Rhone. And we're thrilled to taste through those uh, with you all as well. And uh, once again, thrilled to have Mary Taylor joining us uh, for all of that. Um, without further ado, uh, let us... Um, just going to mute things here. Uh, let us uh, begin with the uh, the proper class here. So um, first and foremost, wanted to welcome back Mary Taylor. Mary, uh, wave to the people, say hi. Hi, people. Hi, DC. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Um, I am going to try to keep my introductory remarks as brief as possible, which means I'll probably wrap up at 5.30, but I'll try to keep it even briefer uh, than that uh, so that we can hear from Mary herself because uh, she has been to the region, she has a wealth of experience with it, and uh, really want her to guide our discussion today. Uh, a few orders of business to kick things off. First and foremost, um, we are um, joined as always by Zoe Nystrom. Zoe, say hello to the people. Hi, everyone. Um, Zoe is a um, essential part of our Revelers Hour and Taylor Cook family. Uh, sadly, she will be lose, leaving the uh, the payroll as such at the end of this month. So uh, we are lucky enough to have her through the end of November on our proper staff. She'll be staying in uh, the wine school uh, orbit um, as much as she's able uh, thereafter. But I'd be remiss if we didn't uh, thank you, Zoe, uh, for everything that you have uh, meant to this place. Um, you know, we wouldn't be where we were uh, without you, we would not have, you know, survived intact um, through pandemic uh, without you as a part of this. And, um, you know, you may be um, moving on uh, professionally, uh, but, you know, um, personally, uh, you will always be a part um, of, of this family. Um, we are celebrating uh, uh, Zoe uh, with a special six packs of wines. So, Zoe, do you want to tell them about the six pack that you have created um, 
as your bon voyage? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, it's a completely mutual feeling. I wouldn't have been able to survive this year without everyone else as well. Um, but to celebrate this awesome community that we've made, um, I have some delicious bubbles, the Vina del Padre, the Lambrusco that doesn't taste like a Lambrusco. It tastes more like a sparkling rosé. It's that Lambrusco de Sobrera. Um, I placed um, local wine, Linden Sauvignon Blanc, the Avinius. Super opulent, bone dry, raging acid, all of the things we love. Um, the Los Bermejos Rosado um, from the Canary Islands, which is super smoky, flinty minerality that I just adore. And um, Comely Chocveri, which is a rosé, definitely the weirdest of the bunch, uh, not for the faint of heart, super, super natty. Um, uh, we have a Chianti Classico for my Italian roots, um, the Felsina for sure, um, and then Aslina, the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, awesome. Uh, and uh, from Nisika Biela, um, uh, Africa's first post-apartheid um, Black African uh, winemaker. Um, and, you know, Zoe, um, I have been inspired by you uh, on many occasions uh, throughout this pandemic uh, journey and by your uh, perseverance um, and, um, you know, warmth um, and just, you know, kind of willingness to put a brave face on things. Uh, and, you know, also um, your commitment to social justice and your commitment to, you know, seeking out wines um, from uh, people that often aren't uh, readily represented um, in the, in the industry. Um, you know, uh, we, again, you know, would not be the place that we are without you. So, um, we'll miss you, girl. Um, at any rate, uh, without further ado, just a, a couple more things. Uh, I want to welcome Lee Eubank if she's in the mix, uh, somewhere. And I want to say a proper happy birthday to, uh, Jessica Beals, uh, who, uh, adorns our, our workplaces with, uh, beautiful, um, wire sculptures and, uh, has been one of our, um, you know, most devoted, uh, supporters. So, um, thank you all. Uh, we are very lucky um, to have the community that we that we do. Um, Brent, uh, let's taste some wine. Um, let's uh, deliver some verse. Uh, we're leaving, uh, you know, Mary uh, muted there. And I want to, I promise, uh, I would try to keep this as brief as possible for the sake of, uh, you know, our introductory uh, sojourn. So I'm going to try to deliver on that promise, uh, Mary, um, and bring you to the mix uh, as soon as I can. But uh, we always begin with a bit of verse, and uh, that is true uh, today as well. Um, we're going to kick things off with uh, a poem um, from uh, one of the foremost uh, modern poets writing in the Occitan language. So Occitan is this uh, Provencal dialect of uh, French, um, and uh, it is inflected with, you know, kind of uh, Catalan, uh, Spanish, um, Italian, um, you know, kind of influences as well. Um, and uh, Frederick Mistral um, wrote his masterpiece, Mireo, um, about um, this kind of thwarted love um, uh, among uh, a young kind of Provencal couple, um, and he celebrates the charms of uh, the Rhone and its river valley. This is an excerpt, he says. Uh, and all along the shore was noble shade by feathery ash and silver poplar made, whose quarry trunks the river did reflect in giant limbs with wild vines all bedecked, with ancient vines and torturous that upbore their knotty clustered fruit the waters o'er. Majestically calm, but wearily, and as he fain would sleep, the Rhone passed by like some great veteran dying. He recalls music and feasting in Avignon's halls and castles, and profoundly sad is he to lose his name and waters in the sea. So we are, are tracing a, a noble uh, river, one of France's most noble uh, rivers, uh, with charts its past, uh, path rather, um, uh, from uh, Switzerland, just north of Lake Geneva, some 810 kilometers uh, south uh, into uh, the Mediterranean. And um, it uh, divides uh, north uh, from south. Um, uh, and uh, the northern region uh, is dominated um, by the grape uh, Syrah, um, but the southern region is dominated uh, by the grape uh, Grenache, uh, which thrives in the uh, sun-kissed kind of dustrier corners of uh, the Southern Rhone. Uh, now, uh, the Southern Rhone in particular is uh, synonymous uh, with Cote de Rhone. And Cote de Rhone is one of the largest uh, designations of origin in the world. It encompasses a region that supplies over 3 million hectoliters of wine, which is you know, more than many countries uh, do. Um, and the vast majority of that wine, which is labeled Cote de Rhone, uh, which you see on supermarket shelves, 
uh, hails from uh, the Southern Rhone. Um, and uh, there's a pyramid of quality here. Uh, the Cote Rhone kind of uh, at the base um, encompasses, encompasses wines offered by 123 different communes. Um, and uh, largely within the Southern Rhone region, um, those wines are dominated uh, by the grape Grenache, um, which um, is a relatively thin skinned varietal, actually doesn't make wines that are uh, very inkily colored, um, but it makes wines that are very high in alcohol. Um, it laughs at drought um, and it gives, you know, opulence of fruit and also this wonderful herbaceousness that the uh, French in, um, you know, the southern corners of the valley associate with Garrigue. Garrigue, this great uh, southern French word which connotes um, this notion of uh, wild uh, herbs trampled underfoot. And I think, you know, when we think of the Mediterranean, we largely think of, you know, these uh, idyllic landscapes of the Southern Rhone of Provence dominated by olive trees, lavender, and the grape vine. And uh, that really is the landscape that you find throughout uh, the Southern Rhone um, and Cote de Rhone synonymous with that. So we're dealing with 123 communes. Uh, as you go up the pyramid and get a little more prestigious, there are 95 communes that can lend their wine to Cote de Rhone Village. Um, and then uh, above that threshold, there are um, 18 individual communes and they can add their name to a hyphen. So if you ever see a label that is um, uh, hyphenated, Cote de Rhone, insert name here, um, Sable being one of the most famous, uh, certainly others that I'm forgetting. Um, those are among the 18 villages that, you know, have gained the right uh, through their renown uh, to hyphenate uh, Cote de Rhone. And then uh, if you receive sufficient renown as a hyphenated offering, then you get to go the one name route. And, um, you know, it's a threshold and a stepping stone, but uh, most famously, Gigandas has traipsed that path in 1971. It went from Cote de Rhone Gigandas to uh, Prince Madonna status and just became Gigandas. Baccarat, uh, you know, kind of followed the same path in 1990 and several others have since. There are 17 of those. Um, so the one named entities, uh, the Gigandas, the Baccarat, the Chateauneufs of the world occupy uh, the top of this tier. And under the French system, uh, typically they are regulated the most stringently. So these are ge geographic designations of origin. Uh, but since the 1930s, they also um, are designations of origin that restrict um, you know, viticultural practice, practices, restrict yields, restrict the grapes that are allowed in the mix. And uh, for the sake of the Southern Rhone, chiefly we are dealing with Grenache, Syrah, and Mavedra as the stars of the show. Um, there are additional grapes that are allowed uh, in villages and typically that is regulated commune by commune uh, throughout this larger region. We are gonna begin our inquiry with a wine from Nimes, um, which is at the Southern extremists of the Southern Rhone is a hugely historically important um, city um, as such. Uh, Gigandas, uh, Vactura, Orange, Avignon, these are, you know, large villages as such. Nimes is a city that has thrived um, since it was the capital of a uh, Gaulish um, kind of, uh, you know, small, uh, you know, it's kind of city state uh, and was subdued by the Romans in 121. The Gauls themselves made wine, uh, the Romans, uh, the Romans uh, expanded upon that winemaking and um, Augustus made Nimes. Um, you know, one of the glories of his empire, and it is adorned by uh, gorgeous amphitheater, um, aqueducts, and temples uh, to this very day, and also makes some of the most uh, delicious uh, wines in the region that punch well above their weight um, for the sake of uh, their value. Um, I'm going to let uh, Mary Taylor uh, speak to uh, the uh, special appeal of Nimes and its history here, because uh, we are starting with a wine from the Costiera Nimes. Uh, you can see it on the map here, just south of the village proper um, in green. Um, Mary, uh, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, I kept it at 15 minutes, uh, victory. Um, uh, I just wanted to kind of give uh, the folks, uh, first and foremost, a sense of how you operate. Um, because, you know, I think people in uh, the States are used to this kind of modality whereby, you know, uh, you know, for the sake of, you know, Michel Gassier, they see Domaine Gassier and in this case, you know, this corresponds to, you know, what we typically think of uh, domain bottled wine. So uh, Michel Gassier and his family, um, you know, they own the vineyards, they make the wine, they bring it to us. Uh, you don't work that way, uh, uh, Mary. So your name is on the label here. Um, and we love your minimalist labels. They're very beautiful. But uh, this bloke, Pierre Vidal, his name's on here too. 
Um, and then, you know, we have the Costa de Nimes, which is a designation of origin. That's a, the point of, of origin for this wine. Um, you know, what gives? Uh, how do you operate, Mary? Hi, I, and I just have to excuse myself. I'm in my pajamas. I was just in the bathtub uh, binge watching The Crown season. Ah, uh, victory. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, so amazing. Um, hi, so yeah, the, um, the way I work is no different from other importers. Um, if you look at a bottle and you flip the bottle around, you'll see a name on it. Maybe it's Rosenthal Wine Merchants. Um, instead of putting my name on the back, I opted to put it on the front. Um, that was kind of, and it's not because, and people ask, who is this woman? Who does she think she is? An egomaniac. And our response is always like, did you ever question who Louis Latour thought he was putting his name on a bottle? But anyway, um, but so I, I had some insights. So I've been on every side of the wine business from auctions to, you know, sommelier, everything. And one thing I noticed is that Americans um, maybe not this crowd, but a lot of Americans, most 99.9% .9 are really confused about wine, whereas they can speak uh, eloquently about cheese. And so that was always my thought, like, why is wine so complicated? So I did kind of this whole research and, um, and I realized that like, maybe, I mean, people feel really safe within the confines of a brand. And I know that sounds really commercial, but my intention is to get the wine out to the people and so and make it easy to try and buy things that they might otherwise not know what it is i don't know i don't know so once people kind of get into my brand maybe they'll try things that will go undrunk you know or they'll change the name to like just the varietal or they're cheapen it up or whatever so i just streamlined my packaging um because uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just easier to find. So that's what I do. I import the wine like anyone else. I don't make it. Um, I'm not even remotely talented at winemaking. I'm really good at wine drinking and tasting. Um, so that's my, my superpower. Did you, uh, did you drink anything while you were watching the crown or? Uh... Um, no, I, I have to confess I'm having a, um, a sour, uh, a, it's sort of a cranberry tinged sour. It's yeah. Sunday. I'm on break, you know. I can only do wine six days a week. Um, yeah, so uh, I lived in Burgundy for uh, some years, and I actually did harvest in the Northern Rhone with Yves Quiron. And oh. I, so I, oh, yeah, I love those wines. Yeah, they're really, there's one vineyard called Le Vertige because it's so vertiginous, it's so steep. And you, you had to like crawl and hold someone's hand figure out how to snip and grab a bunch of grapes and throw them back. And it was quite a feat. It was actually fascinating. Um, but Burgundy, after some years, you know, you get depressed and you watch, you read like Zola novels and, um, <laughs> and there's a, there, in Burgundy, there's a cloud cover all of the time. But when you drive to the Southern Rhone, somewhere below Lyon and be, below the Northern Rhone, around where you're in Cornas on the highway, there's a there's full sunshine and that's why the southern rhone it's like this incredible area for grape growing oh there's there's pierre um yeah it's just incredible for grape growing um with the sunshine but the thing that makes it really interesting is the mistral wind and you're you, you mentioned the oh yeah the, your poet was mistral but it sort of it kind of comes from the word misery because it's 150 days out of the year it's a 70 mile an hour wind you know, people always say like, is the Mistral out today? Um, but it keeps the grapes from um, developing rot and it keeps them cool. So they're not, you know, just over, you know, they're just, it's not all sunshine and heat. They, they need some coolness. And so they have beautiful acidity and um, so, yeah. It so It also helps a lot for disease pressure because you get, you know, what well, moisture you get on the grapes, you know, quickly is, is dried right. out. So you know, in a region, you know, like Virginia, for example, you know, they don't have, you know, the mistral blowing. And because of that, you know, the grapes will start to, you know, rot on the vine. But, you know, in the Rhone, you know, even when, you know, the the rain comes, things, you know, dry out uh, pretty, pretty quickly. So it's very much easier there to work, you know, in a more kind of non-interventionist organic style, you know, without, you know, pesticides and so forth, you know, than it is some other corners of the world. Indeed, so much. Um... But so, yeah, so I, I just love the flavor. So kind of, you know, what you were mentioning about the Garrigue, like that is typical to this area, unlike anywhere else. You can't produce that level of terroir 
by just growing Grenache somewhere and making it like balanced and whatnot. I mean, it had there there is a terroir flavor, and I think that that really I love um, context and I love history. Um, and neem itself, it's cool because like modern day neem is like this working class, you know, French peasant style city where, you know, it's all about textile mills. And of course, denim is denim. Um, yep, there's your amphitheater. And it's on the river, the guard. So in, 90, in 1986, the vineyards here were actually um, of table wine um, status and they were called Costier du Gard. And they changed that when they got Appalachian status, Costier de Neem. Um, unfortunately, uh, they didn't um, police the yields that much. So Costier de Neem was like Beaujolais and other things was associated with like kind of cheap, high yield um, juice and it got like plonk status. So like you, you used to see a lot of rosé. Um, just hold, like, the, hold the phone for yeah. a second, Mary. On the etymological front, um, you're telling me that denim, uh, so the jeans I'm wearing, you know, owe their existence to some extent from the wine I'm drinking. Well, from the city of near the that's wine. You're drinking. <laughs> that's very cool. I, that's that's so, very cool. I, I had no idea. Yeah. If anything starts with a D-E, look at the next word because it usually means of this place. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. So Neem has all this old history. Like, so yeah, we have the, the, the Greeks brought grapes here in the fourth century B.C., um, then it was this big part of the Rome, when Rome and Gaul kind of coexisted, Rome was the south part of France, um, and they really developed. And then, of course, the, 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 bleh, the Pope lived there, um, and that became the new summer palace of the Pope. So they drank a lot. I mean, what else are you going to do? Um, so they loved great wine. So that's why Chateau Neuf du Pop gets, you know, this high status. But they were drinking wine from all over the region. In fact, um, there was a lot more vines planted here, which it is hard to believe because when you go there, there's vines all the way out to the street. I mean, they're just everywhere. Um, but Phylloxera did a number and, you know, it's per capita consumption in France actually went kind of down. It used to be people would drink jugs and jugs of wine every day. Um, but I think the, the quality went way up. So here, so Costier de Nîmes was, it's actually on the side of the Gard River that connects it to the Languedoc wine region. Um, and then in 98, they appealed that and they said, well, our wines are so much more stylistically similar to the Southern Rhone. Um, and they actually, they were approved to move their region. So who knows? Um, and cause I think what well, Languedoc just gets a little bit less of a marketability, we'll put it that way. Um, well, and, and historically Nimes was always attached to, you know, the, the Rhone uh, regionally. And, you know, it's, it's this, you know, for, for all of you, I'll, I'll pull up the map again, but um, the Languedoc is the region kind of uh, to the, the south and, and west of the Rhone. Uh, and Nimes is the furthest kind of Southern extension of the Rhone uh, into uh, the, the Languedoc. Um, you know, but, you know, historically, uh, culturally, you know, it always kind of uh, was tied to, to Avignon, um, you know, as, as, Mary, as Mary said. And, um, you know, surprisingly, even being, you know, in this southern corner of the region, you know, a lot of times the wines end up fresher um, than, you know, some of the wines, um, you know, of, you know, Chateauneuf or Baccarat or, or other corner, Luberon, certainly. Um, how do they manage that, Mary? How do they manage to move so, it? No, to, to maintain freshness in their wines, given how far south they are. They're the coolest of all the climates in the Southern Rhone. Isn't that interesting? Because they get the, the wind that blows from the north part of the Mediterranean, where it's a really warm area, you still get the, the, the winds are very intense. And actually, temperature wise, they are cooler than, because they're, they're also like on the sea. And they're also, um, you know, I mean, like Chateauneuf is a lot more um, inland, but it's high and it's windy. They're very windy there. Um, but so yeah, there's just a, a, like, a, it's a great terroir, but wines have to be made um, properly there. I mean, this is a big deal. So there's a lot of um, kind of meh wine being grown there. There is this one area called Saint-Gilles, um, which is the best of all the terroirs. It's the coolest. This is alluvial pebble. Um, this is alluvial pebble soils and they're really complex. It's like the mini, the mini pudding stones. Um, 
and you have tons they say, of they say, they say uh or so in doing my research they say gray or uh, gray or for the for some of the wheel pebbles the which the what gray my, my french is terrible so it's probably Tell it. <laughs> just just g e with the uh, the backward uh, accent s would be the uh, um for some of the local stones oh maybe i don't know that stone word okay i mean like the so the the most famous of the bunch you know kind of the iconic you know terroir of the region is in chateau and is these massive rounded rounded river rocks that are called galet roulet um and that's like kind of like the most that's the gold standard of you know the kind of southern rhone terroir and you know you see you have these old gnarled you know bush vine grenache there's the ruins of the old castle which actually existed mostly intact until World War II and the Germans bombed it out, uh, you know, very sadly. But, you know, this is kind of like the archetype of the Southern Rhone kind of Grenache heavy uh, vineyard. And, um, you know, they have, you know, some of this, you know, as I understand in Costiere, but the rocks are, are significantly smaller uh, than yeah. the, you know, larger rounded rocks um, in, in Chateauneuf. Yeah, it's kind of a, um, it's, yeah, just, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Chateauneuf is, that's what it's famous for, those pudding stones. And that's, I think they're, they're amazing for winemaking because they retain heat and they let the vines kind of stay a little bit um, warm and et cetera. So this is Pierre. This is actually, um, this one is actually in Chateauneuf in a vineyard that doesn't have a lot of pudding oh, really? stones. <laughs> um, I, just, yeah. I just Googled uh, Pierre Vidal uh, and, oh, and right this cool. image wasn't, there weren't any vineyard specific pictures of him, Mary, I'm sorry. No, they, I can't get a good picture. He's very um, private person. Um, he's a, so I can tell you, so I, he went to the Jules Guillot school in Dijon, which is where like all the great winemakers go, like Christophe Rumier and everybody went there who's great. And so he's really committed to like super, super fine wine. He makes um, Chateauneuf at Domaine des, des Fins Roches, you know this one, Fins Roches. Um, that's his wife's family's property. And then he makes a whole bunch of those village wines. Um, you know, people always say like, oh, you should get a Cote de Rhone. People love Cote de Rhone. And I'm like, mark my words, never. I will never. I do like Bordeaux and bigger known appellations, but Cote de Rhone, I think is like, it's not typicity enough. I mean, it's 50% of the wine from the Southern Rhone is called Cote de Rhone. And I'm like, well, what about Sable and Segure and Vansauvre and all the cool? So he makes a lot of um, a lot of different um, different wines from different places, different appellations, but he doesn't truck the grapes. So this is his like claim to fame. First of all, the all the all the vines that he farms from here are in Saint Gilles, um, and they're basically right next to the Mort de Grey, which is this great winery I love. I don't know if you have those, but I highly recommend finding Morgue de Grey. Um, and so our, our vines are like pretty much in proximity to their vines. And St. Gilles was a, um, yeah, there you go. Um, St. Gilles was a, uh, was a monk, a priest who lived there in the like ninth century and built this beautiful um, vineyard area. And taught winemaking and he's just sort of this great story and it's just a beautiful spot see so can you you can see it if you look it's, it's actually the, the the center of it is the lower right side and there's Arl where um where uh, Van Gogh uh didn't he um like shoot himself in a in a field in Arl or something very sad it sounds it sounds very Van Gogh yeah um I, I, I should I should see Van Gogh less with uh, gunplay than with, uh, you know, uh, self-inflicted knife wounds. All right, the ear. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, what a brilliant man. Um, so, um, so Pierre doesn't truck the grapes because if you truck grapes all around the region, you have to like dump a bunch of sulfur, sulfur on them and they get bruised in the hot sun. So he does something a little bit more garagiste style. Um, I met him through a mutual friend from Corsica, who's a little nuts. Um, and I wanted to work with him years ago. And I was employed by another company. I was this, the, I was like a portfolio manager. For I, hate to, I hate to cut you off, but I just hope that one yeah. day I can start a sentence. I met someone through a mutual friend in Corsica. I feel like that's an amazing <laughs> way to begin any dialogue. <laughs> I went to Corsica in 2002 and we were so poor. We slept on the beach and they could come and raid the beaches at night and get rid of all the vagrants. So, I mean, 
it sounds romantic, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, but so, uh, yeah, so I met him and, you know, I wanted to work with him. I loved his wines, but when I was, I was working for a company and they were so afraid that I was going to like build an empire underneath them while they were paying me a salary and they didn't want to expand my, my range of wines within their portfolio. And that's what kicked me off to leave and go out on a limb and start my own business like this. So I waited, he waited like four years for me. Um, but we always kept in touch and it was, that was the third wine I ever bottled. So, I mean, I have like 20 now. So that was, I've been with this Costier de Nîmes for a long time. That's awesome. Um, I, yeah. And I always go and do the blend um, in like March. Uh, we actually look at different um, tanks um, and we, and we always do that in, in um, he, he, he uh, ages the wines actually in Chateauneuf. He makes them in Postier de Nîmes and then he ages them in Chateauneuf. So we always do tank sample tasting. Um, and so the 17 and 18, I think, do you have two vintages? Is that what I understand? <laughs> uh, we do. And, and for the sake of those at home, um, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, a brilliant, uh, you know, idea and opera. It was just a fact of availability. So um, it just so happened that, you know, in the midst of the several cases that, you know, we purchased for, um, this occasion, uh, the vintage switched over. Um, but I thought it'd be a fun opportunity, uh, nonetheless, to talk about the, you know, difference between the two vintages and then, you know, uh, all the more so to talk about, you know, how does Pierre go about, you know, um, making this wine. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, Grenache is the star of the show, but this is a typical GSM blend. You know, I kind of sped past it, but, um, you know, you often hear wine nerds say GSM and, and, you know, for those of you at home, that is Grenache, Syrah, and Mavedra, and they each offer something, you know, for the sake of the whole. You know, Grenache, um, you know, gives body, um, gives, you know, fuller fruit, gives us like wonderful fleshy tonality. Um, you know, Syrah gives color. Um, it gives acidity if it's not, you know, uh, overcropping. Um, and, you know, it, it can give, you know, structure and darker fruit. Um, then, you know, typically Grenache allows. And then um, Mavedra is the most problematic of the bunch to work with, the latest ripening. Uh, but it gives, you know, this like wonderful minty herbaceousness. It gives these gainier um, qualities um, and uh, it gives tannic structure, um, you know, which, um, you know, is important actually um, for, for, these, for these two grapes in that in region. So they each have something to offer. And this is kind of a fun case in point because um, you see quite a bit of Syrah. Um, in, in Costier, um, and you know, this has a healthy dose of the supporting players. So it's, as I understand, if the text to be believed, and I love your notes online, um, but 60% uh, Grenache, and then uh, the remainder split between um, a veteran Syrah. Right, so for me, I mean, I love Syrah from the North. I love the horsey lavender qualities of Northern Rome Syrah, but the Southern Syrah, I don't like as much. I really, I think I need a higher acid to go with all that sunshine. So, you know, I'm, I'm always happier to have a Grenache heavy blend. So here we have Grenache that's, you know, this is all vinified separately. The Grenache is unfiltered um, and it's unoaked. Um, the Syrah and the Morvedra are, um, oak, they're oaked a little in second year barrel. So you have a little, this is the only wine I think I have that's oaked. Um, but it's 40% of the blend is oaked. What are you drinking, Bill? Uh, I have uh, the 2018. Um, okay, yeah. So um, they were so different. The, yeah, because I was I was actually, Mary, I was curious to try it because I'd had the 2017. I haven't, haven't had the 17, I think, until or since I tasted with you many moons ago. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, I am not the most um, uh, kind of proficient uh, note taker, but uh, I have a decent memory for wine, but you know, what I loved about this wine, uh, you know, uh, at first glance was that I feel like it embodied exactly what I want out of a Southern Run Red, which is to say it had this, you know, generosity of fruit, you know, uh, but there was something else there. So, you know, it's very easy to make a fruity wine. Um, you know, it is comparatively difficult to make a fruity wine that also, you know, has other, you know, dimensions of, of flavor. And, you know, this, you know, delivers that. So, you know, um, you know, the 17, I think, is, is a, a more savory wine um, and, you know, more herbal wine and, and, and uh, you know, a little brinier. This, this has, you know, kind of, a, you know, more of like a, a, a dried fruit, you know, kind of reduced fruit quality to it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there's still this like um, dried olive thing going on. And as it opens up, you get more of that like uh, herbal leaf um, that, you know, I, I really adore out of these wines when they're singing. 
yeah for, for me the 17 which was a better vintage in the area of um i it's much more polished to me i get like it's just more sort of um like all kind of integrated and refined somehow and like it kind of reminds me of an old cello a little bit um but the 18 for me is more like crunchy which to me means like a little bit more like for me it's like apple. chewy there's like a chewiness to it you know it's like okay. uh, yeah it's, it's like uh you know, it's got this like a little bit of that like fruit leather thing going on, but not in a bad way. It's just like, uh, you know, they sink your teeth into it one. Yeah, I get a little, the acidity sometimes um, is like kind of higher than I would expect. And then I get like a tiny touch of volatility, which is cool. I guess it, it's fashionable. Um, but yeah, I mean, this these wines are super popular and the, the yield is pretty low. We keep the yields, you know, he keeps the yields like down under around 40. Um, sulfur is low and then it's actually all organic so the 17 is 100% organic and the 18 we used a little bit of fruit from a vineyard that isn't certified so we can't put organic on the label and I'm kind of not like a huge organic person in viticulture because um, I mean there's a huge philosophical debate in in France and in wine making circles but I used to be uh, the girlfriend of a, a wine grower in in Burgundy and I would write about wine back then. And um, I'd always be talking about like Joe Dresner and organic, organic, organic. And he was like, stop it. So we would have this debate, but I learned a lot about why he thought it was worse for the land to use that much cop copper and sulfur. And yep. that like, if you did a very, very moderate treatment, sometimes it's better for the earth and for the, you know, everything involved and for the wine itself to use a treatment instead of a whole bunch of copper. So that was his argument all the time. So we have, and I've heard this a lot. And also, you know, you have to pay, you have to pay for that certification, but. And I think I find it too, uh, Mary, you know, like it, writing about wine, you know, drinking wine on the consumer side, you know, it's much easier to be, it's much easier to kind of rigorously enforce philosophical purity. Whereas when you're, you know, working at vineyard making wine where the rubber meets the road, you know, you're dealing with realities in the vineyard that demand you know, more aggressive interventions than you might, you know, easily conscience if you were just thinking about things philosophically. Um, right. And I just, I just wanted to uh, share your, your copy because it's no doubt you're the one that writes all the website uh, notes, aren't you? Yeah. Because I, I love the, I love the copy for this particular uh, bottle. Uh, if you could bottle all the romance of summer in the south of France, the dazzling sunlight of a Cezanne painting, and the warm sea breeze blowing through the hillsides of lavender and thyme, <laughs> you'd wind up with something a bit like Pierre Vidal's beautiful expression of the Costier Nîmes appellation. Uh, I think that's that's you know really evocative and lovely. Um, and I will say, you know, for me too, there's this like wonderful floral, um, you know, kind of quality uh, that uh, emerges on the the finish uh, with this wine. And and again, you know. That prettiness, you know, and that that lift, you know, is what these wines are about. Because I think, you know, with something like this, that's you know, you know, bigger, more substantive, that you know, is is chewy or crunchy, however you want to qualify it. You know, you're always going to be struck by that at first. But you know, it's how the wine evolves, you know, over the course of its time on your palate that ultimately, you know, um, you know, says more about about what it is. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I think these are complex wines. I mean, they're it's it's not like I'm trying to get like the best. Why? I mean, I'm trying to just show people what each appellation is or each appellation I work with is like, you know, and so I'm not trying to say this is like the greatest of all the Costier de Nîmes, but for me, for like value for price, for good farming, for authentic, for this guy is like maybe my most perfectionist of all my winemakers. By the way, I see a bunch of comments and I just didn't understand like who, how many people does she work with? I just wanted to, because I is there anyone she won't work with? Um, uh, yeah, so so do you want to do you want to interject and uh, throw out some questions for for Mary? So I think it's a good question. You know, how do you um, do yeah. people reach out to you about you know having you represent them? You know, uh, you said that uh, you came to Pierre through um, you know this uh, you know wild racy uh, Corsican connection. Yeah. Uh, um, you know uh, how how do how do you search for you know the the vignerons? Well, in this Corsican, we're we're sort of friends, but I found out he was supported Marine Le Pen, and so we're kind of not. Friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, that is a deal breaker. <laughs> I know, um, but so uh, there's there's no like one way. I mean, wine comes to me 
in so many different ways. In this case, this was a, somebody who looked me up years ago and we went out for tea, coffee and, um, and I, I liked the wines and they kept sending me samples every year and checking in and, and I liked the wines a lot. But then when I met him, I was like, oh my gosh, like this guy is super serious. And, you know, he almost was like, I don't know if you know, I had to go like be interviewed to be able to work with him. He's a little more like, he's probably the, the most serious and rigid. Um, but like, for example, I do like Valence. I think you've had that one before. Uh, that's um, uh, the Sophie's wine, right? Sophie's. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I found Sophie in the, um, in Angers at the Loire Valley Wine Fair. And like, I saw this woman with this big red wool sweater and like old style glasses. And, you know, you just saw a farming woman, like she's a goat farmer, you know, standing behind a table in the Loire Valley Wine Fair. And I was like, interesting. So, and I, I looked over at her, her wine bottles and they were like, hideously packaged. Like, <laughs> like, you are not a designer. Like, but you're a great winemaker. So I ended up tasting with her and um, loving their vibe. And I love the wines and they were calling it all um, Turenne, like Gamay and stuff. And I was like, would you be willing to work with me? But um, instead of calling it Turenne Pinot Noir, would you do uh, like a AOC Valence? Cause your vines are in Valence. Like, why don't you? And then she pulls out a Valence, like a blended Valence, you know, again, like terrible label. And I was like, this is perfect. So I just, you know, I mean, I've developed, and then when we visited, like we were the only, our license plate was Parisian um, from our rental car at the airport. And uh, like the whole village was like the Parisians have, arrived. you know, like, and the, little did they know the Americans had arrived and like, nobody goes to this village. And like, you know, we were in the restaurant, everyone comes up to the table to practice their English. It's a totally different world than snobby France like all like Nîmes is a working class city um this is like really the the they call it la France profonde it's like an insult it means like the profound it's like the rednecks um and that's how I found her I find people in all there's this really funny um tasting uh group called APVSA they're out of Montreal and they like agent um they're they just set these things these tastings up for growers that don't have importers in America and they're like, you know, every six months, New York, Los Angeles, you know, wherever, Chicago. Um, I don't know if they do DC, but it's like- I the, feel like we're not, we're not sufficiently cool. Well, it's like, yeah, well, it's the sweetest bunch of like, like just innocent, independent family growers. And I've met like four of my growers with this group. And like in New York, you know, in pre-pandemic days, it, there was like, 50 tastings a week, like the buyers were overwhelmed with choice and like nobody would go to these. So I could walk into a room without seeing like my customers in the room and like I could taste the room and get to know people and like three or four people would be in the room at the same time. Like nobody was there. I never had to wait. I could connect with these growers. And so I found them. That's actually how I found my first wines, which were the Bordeaux Blanc and Rouge. But, you know, and then like just... I love wine fairs like and I love the really regional ones like the Percé du Vin Jaune in the in the Jura when they pierce the seven year Vin Jaune barrel like that's a festival and no Americans are there and because I was like in a winemaking family for a bit in France um, I you know got to go to all these things and we go into all these cellars and that's all we did for years is just taste 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 in caves he was actually from uh, Mont Louis in the Loire Valley, but he lived. We lived together in Bone, um, so I had this, and he had a whole big opinion about a lot of things. And I think he's one of the great winemakers in the world still. Um, Domaine de Croix. I don't know if you Grand Cru sells them up here. I don't know if you've seen I'm not, those. I'm not good with Burgundies and Miasma. I'm 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 not I'm not as good with it as I'd like to be. Um, well, we can. You know, the wine is so interesting because it's like. Yeah. There's so many the science and history okay. and language. And it was just so cool. Um, but yeah, so we would just go to all these places. And then I had a wine store in lower Manhattan. I, I, I didn't own it. I uh, bought for it for three years. And my selections then were like all Italian. Like I had a 90% Italian store and I got really, really, really obsessed with Italy. So like I've had, you know, I've been in the business since 92 um started in cheese so I've, I've kind of kicked the tires of the wine business um more than most <laughs> so so it's really pretty easy to find I just found a um 
I just found a Navarra producer who I'm so excited about. And he, where did I find? Oh, I met him at Zach Kelly. Is it Picuda Prieto or? Um, oh, no, it's, it's, it's Navarra. So it's actually a Grenache. Oh, okay. Navarra. It is unoaked and it's so, so beautiful. It was like this dream I found and we're working together. So that's coming. Um, we do, I do a lot by mail right now too. Everything's by mail, you know? I just have them send me a bottle as olive oil and it shows up at my door and I <laughs> wait three days, crack it and there it is. Um, so yeah, that's how I found my growers and I haven't really broken up with anyone. Um, I love the people I work with. Um, yeah, I haven't really, so, you know, sometimes a cuvee or a, a vintage is a little less than I love and I'll just like kind of take the pedal off the gas if I don't you know, really love it. Um, or if it's not good, I'll, you know, I, I haven't, I had a lot of corked wines from the Douro in 2015. So they were like, we'll just send you 25 extra cases to make up for it. And so, I mean, we're off that vintage and 16 is perfect because they fixed the problem, which were the, with the corks. Um, so I apologize if anyone had a corked Douro, call me up, I'll, I'll replace it. But um, yeah, that's basically how I work. Um, like every other importer, you know, I just have a a brand name on the label, which all the hipsters um, think I'm like commercial and cheesy. And, and I'm like, yeah, well, hipsters, I might point out that, you know, Gallo and Constellation brands own like 90% of the wine business, like, and you're all fighting for a piece of pie. What, whereas most Americans are walking around, not sure what's what, and don't know if Sancerre is a place or a grape. And, um, and I want to make something with no capital and no overhead and no investors that um, like basically white labeling the Appalachian system of all the things that are interesting and not expensive and between like, you know, 10 and 20 bucks. And that's, that's kind of my uh, business model. So there it is. Why yeah. not? You know, what appeals to me about it is, is there's a level of democratization about it because, you know, you're taking something that's, you know, wildly obscure in terms of these designations of origin that, you know, most Americans aren't familiar with. And, you know, I think most Americans struggle with the idea that, you know, on the continent, people think about wine in terms of designation of origin, in terms of place. And then, you know, so we have this thing that is Cosierra Nimes, but, you know, it happens to be, you know, from these, you know, grapes, because we're so varietally driven, you know, it's Grenache, Syrah, Mavedra. Um, and, you know, that's a lot to unpack. But, you know, if people try your wines and they like your house style, then, you know, there's a foot in the door and they can continue to look for the same labels and try some things that they might not other try and you know, otherwise try and the barriers to entry are low because you know the price points are super affordable. So, um, you know, there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, we're gonna speed through a few things. Uh, first and foremost, for those of you that have Michel Gassier's um, Cossier Nîmes Blanc, um, I just wanted to share a picture of them because they are lovely uh, people. So um, Michel um, is uh, the older gentleman here. Um, his family were Pied Noir, so they were um, uh, uh, French, um, uh, ethnically French people making wine in Algeria, um, who prior, or essentially, you know, actually prior to, they read the writing on the wall and prior to the um, uh, kind of, um, uh, kind of hottest, um, you know, kind of uh, portion of the Algerian independence struggle, um, left and established um, uh, a new uh, set of vineyards in Costier. Um, and, uh, uh, he runs the roost there. Uh, his wife um, is an American. Uh, these are, 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 sorry, that's his daughter. That, I made that really weird uh, for Michelle. I apologize, his wife is here. Um, uh, at any rate, and uh, uh, they're lovely, lovely people. Um, they're friends of the restaurant. Uh, their son uh, lives in Mount Pleasant um, and represents their wines on this side of the Atlantic. Um, I, I love the whites and Costier. They have, you know, some of the freshness that, um, you know, Mary talked about. Uh, this particular offering is Grenache Blanc heavy. Um, and, you know, in as much as the reds are kitchen sink blank, uh, blend of varietals, the whites tend to be as well. Um, and this has this kind of forward fruitiness, but elegance, uh, nonetheless, um, that I think is, is really um, lovely. And, and the name Notre Pais is this, um, you know, uh, our, our land, our, our, our country, you know, is this idea of encapsulating the place in, in a single wine. And then uh, we have a bunch of, um, you know, kind of uh, single Appalachian driven wines. Um, and, and Zoe, I promise we'll get to you and, and Mary, please feel free to offer color, color commentary. Um, if you know these estates, um, and you want to offer up tasting notes and, um, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, feature some of, um, my favorite wines from the region and, you know, something that we haven't kind of addressed, talked about, um, as such yet, um, is, you know, whether you're taking a, a set of grapes and, you know, destemming them. So in the case of the Costier Nimes that we just drank, 
um, all the grapes are, are destemmed, um, and there's this like real, you know, kind of purity uh, of fruit to the wine. Um, whereas for the sake of the first couple wines in the flight, um, the uh, Chateauneuf and the Gigandas, uh, you're dealing with, you know, um, avowed traditionalists who are not destemming in the least. So the first one is um, a Chateauneuf de Pop um, from Domaine uh, de uh, Pegau. Um, and uh, this is um, from a uh, really amazing uh, uh, woman, uh, Laurence uh, Ferrar. Um, she's a, a total, um, yeah, she's just a, a, a really cool lady, um, uh, makes really um, lovely, uh, very traditional uh, wines. Um, and uh, she tells the story, the origin story of her domain as follows. Uh, my father, my grandfather was French going back many generations. My mother's parents were from Tuscany. They moved to Avignon to find work. My father's mother uh, came to Chateauneuf, uh, worked as a cleaner, as a waitress, where she met my grandfather. Uh, my grandmother was ambitious and started working in the vineyards and step by step began buying vines. She started with nothing, but when she died, she had 22 hectares, which is 54 acres, which is a shit ton of land. Uh, should be said in one of the most famous corners of uh, France. Um, uh, they were divided between her four children. Um, uh, Laurence's father got five hectares. Um, Laurence inspired her father actually uh, to break with his siblings and to make wine on his own uh, beginning in the 80s. And um, she really wanted to, she studied winemaking and is kind of um, classified as this real traditionalist uh, within uh, Chateauneuf. Um, uh, and I love, um, you know, the unabashed um, kind of um, kind of uh, structure uh, of her wines. Uh, Zoe, um, for the sake of tasting notes on this one, um, you know, uh, the Chateauneuf from Pegal, this is our Cuvée um, tradition, uh, 2017, 100% um, whole cluster. So all the stems in the mix for the sake of vinification, no, um, you know, demonstrable oak influence, all neutral fooder. Um, uh, what did you get uh, on the palate for the sake of this one, Zoe? Um, I really enjoyed the texture of this wine. It's super chewy, super gritty, um, and just a super per um, persistent finish. Um, I really like how meaty the wine is as well. Um, and I have more dried fruit complexity and a lot of dried florals that are quite pretty on the nose. Um, and it's definitely more like black fruit um, leaning. What is the sapage again on this, Bill? Um, so a very good question. So this is 80% Grenache, um, and then a hodgepodge of the other varietals. Um, a fun parlor game at all uh, at home uh, that we haven't played with you all. Uh, famously, there are 18 or sorry, 13 rather varietals uh, allowed in, in Chateauneuf. I think they've recently expanded that uh, to encompass both uh, red, um, kind of green, and, 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 and white versions of different varietals. But these are the famous uh, 13 and their preponderance in the region. Um, it is a very nerdy psalm parlor game to ask someone uh, to name them all uh, by memory. but. Um, you know, kind of indicative of the place that Grenache holds in the region as the, you know, real backbone of a lot of these blends. And then uh, Syrah Mervedra are the, the chief kind of character actors in the mix. And then, um, you know, you have a bunch of extras um, aside, aside from that. Um, uh, Mary, you were nodding along a lot. Um, uh, I imagine that uh, you had these wines before. Uh, what, do you, what do you like about them? Well, I used to sell these wines and I know Laurence pretty well. Um, way back, what, like in 2009, I was uh, working for the company that distributed her wines. Um, I just, I mean, you, what you said, I think it's amazing. I love whole cluster, just like in Burgundy, drinking Dujac, like the old Dujac and Reyes. And I love the way she makes wine. I, I think whole cluster is awesome. And I think stems are awesome. And um, I love the earthiness. And I, I'm never disappointed with her wines. They don't you know, there it don't doesn't she have one like the capo or something yeah. the top? Yeah, yeah. Like that one is a little bit like whoa. Like I like kind of the this this range. It's a little bit. Um, I think it has more like um, gastronomic qualities, and I want to. It sort of makes my mouth water, and I want to eat with that. Um, yeah, I think I I just think they're elegant and red fruited, and she has a great touch, and she's a super super badass. Like she's she's like the when she walks into a room everybody's like wow like she's just a powerful woman i love her so yeah um, yeah yeah and, and you 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 get a sense of that you know just in in reading about her and then you know yeah she seems like a a bit of a bon vivant and you know the finest you know possible sense and uh, for me what I, I really love about these wines when they're they're on and what i love about you know this notion of whole cluster so again you know with most modern wines 
um, when people make a red wine, they destem. And, you know, historically that never would have been the case because people didn't have machines that were capable of it. But um, taking the grapes off the stem makes something that has less of that, you know, tannic grip that people generally don't like. But it can rob, rob a wine of texture. It can rob a wine of, you know, these like more savory herbaceous qualities that, you know, are very interesting to those of us that love the technique and, you know, kind of love something more savory out of their wines. And, you know, what I love about it in Rhone Reds, in Grenache in particular, is, is the mouthfeel of it and the way the wines evolve um, as they age. And, and, you know, this is a wine that's delicious and it resonates, you know, on the nose, but the, the texture, the feel of it, you know, is, is a different experience. You know, the sensuality of it, you know, across the palate is, is equally enjoyable. And then uh, we have uh, another, so uh, the next estate um, is among my favorite wines in the world. Um, I, I have loved, adored this wine uh, for a long time. Um, and, and, you know, um, you know, we'll continue to sell it till the day I die. Should be said that they make a rosé. Um, that is the closest thing I've ever had to, um, you know, weed in wine form. Uh, when in some vintages, it smells like a dispensary, you know, just, you know, like, you know, putting your bag, you know, putting your nose in, in, in a bag, uh, you know, kind of thing. And, and it's like the, it's like if you, that Grieg we were talking about earlier, if you, you know, kind of like distilled that into some essence, you know, it is, it is that. Um, they are avowed uh, celebrants of uh, that whole cluster methodology as well. Um, there are three generations going on strong, um, uh, female owned and operated. So this estate is called Gour de Chalet. Um, it is in Gigondas. Gigondas is um, adjacent to um, uh, Chateauneuf, um, Avillon, um, but it is at elevation. And uh, it should be said um, that there is this very famous um, uh, rock formation um, it's called the Donti de Montmirail, and, and I, I, I apologize, um, uh, Mary, because I know you actually speak French, and, and um, you know, uh, regular viewers will know that my French is terrible, um, but uh, it is, uh, Donti refers to tea, and uh, it's, um, you know, this beautiful mountain range, um, and they love to say in Gigondas that they look down on Chateauneuf, and uh, the cool thing about Chateauneuf, about Gigondas is the harvest is several weeks, a couple weeks, you know, uh, several, can be several weeks later, than it is in Chateauneuf. So there's a freshness about these wines um, that in certain vintages is lacking in Chateauneuf. And I, I think she can, I think, you know, Gorda Chalet really leans into that. Um, I, I love how herbal, uh, you know, these wines are. They're, they're, you know, they have that fruit, but, you know, it's not always the first thing um, that you would uh, say about them. Uh, uh, Zoe, for your sake, um, what are your tasting notes on this one? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I, ooh, am I? Perfect. I thought I was muted. Um, I didn't necessarily get the weed on this one. I got more of the minty eucalyptus. Okay. Um, there have been a lot of comments about weed of a different wine, but we'll get to the Vun too later. Um, I thought that this had some really nice, bright, juicy fruit, super exuberant, and that like generosity of fruit like went um, like completely to the end. It was still very nice and high toned. I really enjoyed that acidity with how bombastic that fruit is. It's like the perfect gigandas for me. Um, it should be said though, I was I was talking more about the rosé. The This one resonates more on like a crunchy black peppercorn, like a steak au poivre, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of uh, place uh, than, than the, the marijuana. Um, but, uh, you know, at any rate. Um, uh, Mary, I know that you um, are familiar with this estate as well, um, uh, you know, how do you feel about Gigandas vis-a-vis Chateauneuf uh, and uh, Gorda Chalet? Yeah, I mean, I think that Gigandas is a great place to find value. I think that there's, um, the quality is similar. Um, by the way, those Dante is, they, you can see them when you're driving on the highway. They're like poke out of the Alps, you know? Yeah. Um, those are like the foot, Alps Rhone foothills. Um, yeah, I think there's, I think that there's some really, really high quality wineries in Gigondas. Um, I th think it's a great, I mean, there's, there's some wines out there. I mean, weirdly, those wines get closed out a lot for some you reason. Seem, you seem somewhat, uh, <laughs> you seem somewhat tepid. You seem reserved. You're holding back on Gigondas. No, I mean, I, I, you know, honestly, I have to tell you, honestly, I haven't been in a Southern Rhone kick for a really long time. Yeah. So I have my Costi Um it's, it, you know, we, we do a lot of work with that. Um, but I really need to go back. Like I got kind of snooty and was all about the Savoie and the Jura and Burgundy and the Northern. <laughs> and I, 
I kind of, I used to be in love with Gigondas and Baccaras and Chateauneuf, kind of. I mean, I, I think, um, I think the, one of the greatest wines I ever had um, was uh, a 1990, um, oh God, the Cuvée Catalan from, um, from Chave, you know this one? Oh yeah. The Hermitage, that was probably the best wine I've had from the Rhone in my life, but, um, oh, Clos de Pop, sorry, Clos de Pop and Chateauneuf. Ah. I'm like, my brain has been exposed to too much wine for 30 years. Um, but the 90 Clos de Pop, I think you kind of have to age. For me, like Brunello and Chateauneuf and those big, big tenants. They're bruising, they're bruising wines. And I think, you, you know, you're someone that values freshness in your wines. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, Chateauneuf and the Southern Rhone in general doesn't always provide that. But what I do like about Chigan Doss is it offers a little more. Um, as a segue, um, uh, we're moving, going to move on to, uh, and, and I, I think, Maybe this is the uh, the dispensary uh, um, kind of uh, reference, but move on to the uh, Ventoux. Um, so Ventoux is this, uh, they call it the Bald Mountain in France. Um, it's a very famous stage of the Tour de France is to climb Mont Ventoux. I wanted to bring back the map and just give you uh, an orientation. So Chateauneuf is in the heart here. Um, it's uh, the confluence of all these, um, you know, rivers, the Rhone and its various tributaries. Um, and, you know, those polished uh, stones, the pudding stones, you know, um, were polished by, uh, you know, the river and various, you know, stages of mountain formation and glaciation. Um, but, you know, we had uh, the Gigandas, which is uh, in green, and now we have the Bontu, um, which is massive um, mountain to the east. It's called the, uh, the Giant of Provence. Um, it's this limestone capped peak, um, and they don't uh, feature it every year in the Tour de France, but there's one of the most famous climbs um, in the Tour de France. Uh, we're drinking a wine from Chateau Pestier, um, uh, purchased by the, uh, a family in the, in the 70s, but an ancient estate. Um, there's this major cooling influence in, in uh, Ventoux. And so uh, it's better ter uh, terrain for uh, Syrah than you uh, would typically uh, expect um, in the Southern Rhone. So this is a cuvee that's equally split between Syrah and Grenache. And then it has a shit ton of new oak. Uh, so 50% new oak, um, 18 months. Um, and then it's fully distemmed. And, and I, I wanted to feature it as such, um, as stylistically a foil for the other wines, um, because uh, I, you know, in spite of myself, so, you know, you say like, uh, you know, 100% distemmed, you know, 50% new oak. And, and, you know, these are things that are on their face, you know, typically I wouldn't, you know, find myself gravitating to. Um, uh, but, um, you know, again, uh, oak as such, you know, descending as such, you know, there's, there's no ill in it, you know, it's, it's all contextual. And, you know, if it makes sense for a particular terroir, if done well, um, then you can make something that's profoundly delicious. And Pasquier, uh, Pasquier does that year in and year out. Um, you know, I find for their wines and, and they are, you know, very sustainable in the vineyard and then uh, all native yeast, which matters to me a lot for the sake of the vinification. Uh, Zoe, what did the commenters say about this one? This is the dispensary wine for sure. Um, a lot of those types of notes, a lot of um, black yeah, pepper and tobacco. Though. Pardon? I, I get a little more barnyard than than dispensary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe I, think I was. Um, maybe we're going to different dispensaries. Maybe that's the. Uh... I don't know. I was um, more distracted by like just that toasty vanilla and how um, round everything was, and it almost gave this assumption of sweetness. But it really is that like perfect smoky sweet bacon fat that I love, love, love. Um, a lot of like sour dark fruits too so it was kind of like balanced with that feels it feels like the i don't know so they, they don't say what the percentage is that it, it's it's high altitude sites um and and you know half century plus year old vines for both the Syrah and Grenache they don't you know reveal the um percentages of both but for me the Syrah is the real driver um you know for the sake of this wine you know the, the Grenache you know lends uh you know fleshiness and, and body definitely so it doesn't taste like you know, Hermitage, um, but, you know, that bacon fat, that, you know, sun-dried black olive, you know, that is pure Syrah, you know, and, and, and it is, you know, the Syrah, you know, for the sake of the flavor profile is, is really the star of the, the show um, on this one. Um, but, you know, I, I do get a new oak influence, but, you know, it's not, it, it's well integrated. You know, again, it's, it, it doesn't feel disjointed. I feel like the whole um, is greater than the sum of the parts, um, which is, you know, ultimately what we're all after. Uh, for the sake of our wines. And then uh, lastly, we have Vaucluse. Um, I'm really excited to include this one because it comes from, um, you know, this really iconic 
um, uh, estate. And um, I reached out to uh, Mary to, to kind of um, participate in this lesson and, and wanted to know, you know, who, you know, should I reach out to, which one should I include? And I was actually really disappointed that a lot of the estates that she wanted us to feature aren't as well represented in DC as, as I would like. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, feature, you know, some of my old favorites for the sake of whole cluster. And, um, but, you know, wanted to find something um, from uh, this uh, particular uh, family. So uh, this is uh, Renault. So you have uh, Jacques Renault and Amelia Renault, um, uh, grandfather and uh, grandson, uh, grandfather on the right, grandson on the left. Um, they um, are uh, the men behind Chateau Reyes. Um, Reyes is the, um, one of the great names in Chateauneuf, but it kind of transcends Chateauneuf. Um, people think of those river stones in Chateauneuf, but uh, fasc fascinatingly enough, Reyes actually favors uh, heavier clay soils and north facing sites. And their wines don't taste like the Chateauneuf of popular imagination. Um, you know, they are much more elegant um, and much more, you know, dare I say Burgundian um, than your typical, um, you know, Chateauneuf. And uh, for the people that love them, uh, that's what they love about them. Um, they're hugely rare, hugely expensive. Um, you know, I'm in the business and I think I've had them once, um, and that's because uh, I worked at a fine dining establishment and, um, you know, somebody was, you know, kind enough to give me a taste of the bottles they bought in for the sake of corkage. Um, this is a property that they own. It's just outside of Rockera. Um, This is kind of like a village level wine that they make. Um, it's stupidly good. Um, we have the 15 and the 14 in the mix. Um, their Cote de Rhone sells for, you know, $50. Um, but it is worth every fucking penny, um, you know, so if you find these wines, just buy them. Um, they're, you know, they're just great wines. You know, they happen to be from the Southern Rhone, but they exist in the pantheon of great wines. Um, uh, Mary, um, uh, you know, what do you uh, want to say about, you know, these particular offerings? Yeah, so, I mean, I worked in the auction circuit for a long time, so I saw a lot of these um, early. Um, I think in the mid, like Emile Renaud died, um, I think in like 96 or something. And just like some great estates where the father was a complete artist and, you know, sometimes the new generation takes over. I extend this to like Dujac that I think that happened a little bit and um, LaPierre and Morgone, I think that happened. Um, so the father was like this kind of um, eccentric man. A few, some friends of mine went to this the, the property, you had to sort of call him up and- um, So there's a, there's actually a famous story about that, Mary. So uh, we said that uh, Manuel Renaud is famously, uh, famous for refusing appointments and even winery phone, the winery phone tells callers that any messages will not be listened to. So please try again later. Right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. My friend, Chris, who's a, um, he's an Indian biochemist and he's in his um, upper sixties and he's, the most passionate wine person I know. He has maybe four or five tasting dinners a week with like collectors and he's collected. And these aren't necessarily wealthy people. It's not about the prestige, it's about the fascination. So um, he actually was able, so they pulled up and they saw, uh, um, I guess Emmanuel, I said Emile, That's, there's a lot of French guys with the name Renaud out there. Um, but he was, poking his head out behind the curtain hiding from them but somehow yeah. you know they kind of just hung around and he finally came and um, they did it so i'm actually yeah. so this is an this is a, i'm reading directly from an article and it's it says that um jacques Renaud was known to hide in the winery or behind an odd, odd pine tree to avoid <laughs> guests when they had arrived and even yeah, exactly. his own, and even his own importers right exactly yeah. Um, yeah. and when he if you got into the cellar he'd give you a a glass with no um, base, so you couldn't take notes or put down the glass. He had like <laughs> weird eccentricities, um, but the wines are just amazing. And you have like the Pignon and the Foncelet, and then the regular Chateau Reyes, and then the Chateau de Tour, the Cote de Rhone. Um, but I just think that they're like, they're so outspoken. They're so full of like the Garrigue, but more than that, like they're they're just magical wines. I really, if I was very wealthy, I'd look at um, every auction catalog and find older vintages and, and buy them all. Um, highly recommended. And 
you know, as, as would be fit, you know, people as, you know, kind of uh, socially reticent as they are, there's zero information available online uh, about how these wines are made. Um, there's obviously no new oak influence. Um, you know, I would be shocked if they're not harvesting significantly earlier than their neighbors. Um, you know, the, I think there's a, for those of you that have a flight, a real stark difference between the color um, in, you know, three wines that we had, the, the, the first two, um, at least 80% 80, 80 plus Grenache, and then, um, you know, the Syrah will bring more into the party. And this, this one looks comparatively ethereal. Um, it should be said, there's no Mavedra in the mix. This is a, a Grenache heavy, I would imagine, but Cunois, a Syrah, and Sancel in the mix. Um, again, Syrah is, is one of the spices that, you know, really resonates. And, and for me, um, I taste a lot of Syrah in this, um, uh, you know, but the color, you know, fascinatingly enough is, is more indicative of something that is, you know, like cooler climate Grenache, um, which doesn't take on a ton of, ton of color. So, you know, I'd be wildly curious to know what uh, the, you know, exact blend is. Um, I would be equally surprised if that information was available anywhere um, and equally surprised if like the winemakers themselves actually had the information. Um, they're probably just tasting lots and not, you know, usually scientific about it. And they're just, you know, making wine the way people should make wine, which is to say, you know, guided by their palate. Um, you know, uh, but, you know, there's definitely like, you know, some whole cluster, but I'd be surprised if it's like entirely whole cluster. It's, it's, it's one of those wines so that, you know, just lives in the mystery. And, and it is, you know, I, I think the, to some extent, you know, even the house style, you know, trumps any regional imprint. Um, and there, there's magic uh, about it in, in a really cool way. Uh, so do we have any, any um, comments about this one or do you have any comments off yourself? Yeah, I absolutely love this wine, of course. Um, there's been a lot of comments of how musty it is or um, a really good one is a 50 year old candy box that's found in an old closet. Uh. Love that note. I feel like that should be a cartoon. Um, I get like a lot of like brick and clay. I think it's ethereal is what I, my first note. So I love that you said that. Um, so much olive, bright, chewy fruit. It's yeah. certainly like the fruit purity is just incredible. I thought that it would be, I don't know, have a little bit more of those like secondary flavors and tertiary flavors coming in, but not really. Um, it did remind me of like dehydrated orange zest though. Um, and it had that like almost like Christmassy spice to it that I love. Like a chocolate orange or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's no, no, yeah, I, I, I could totally see that. Um, yeah, it, it, and it is. It's one of those wines that, um, you know, just continues to open up and reveal itself over time. And, um, you know, even in, it, it should be said, with kind of like, for the sake of these flights, sometimes I, I, I feel guilty because, you know, the worst thing you can do to a lot of these bottles, and these aren't you know, hugely old wines, you know, 2014, 2015, but, you know, um, they're getting older. And you, the worst thing you can do is open them, pour them into a small glass vessel, and then, you know, send them out into the world. Uh, but, you know, it's, they're showing, you know, really, really beautifully. Um, and, you know, honestly, that, that's why we continue to do it and, you know, uh, try to pick wines that can endure as such. But um, yeah, it, it, it just, it, again, it, it's, you know, it bears the imprint of the Southern Rhone. I think, you know, it, it tastes, you know, unmistakably of like olive tapenade in a way that is hugely evocative. Um, but by the same token, you know, within the context of these four wines, it is singular um, as well. And, and, and for me, that is, you know, that's the imprint of greatness in wine is, is something that, you know, tastes of a place, but, you know, has a singularity about it. Um, and, you know, those are the experiences that will make you, you know, want to, you know, just spend more than you should for bottles and, you know, chase, chase the, you know, chase the unicorn, um, you know, and, and I think, once you taste that in wine, once you have, you know, that experience of, of, you know, recognizing something, you know, that evokes place that is singular, it's, it's hard to, it's really pernicious. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to give that up. Um, all right. So, uh, so I know, I know you must have more questions. I want to toast everybody out because um, uh, that's what we do. And, and thank Mary again for joining us. Um, uh, it should be said that, you know, one of my uh, favorite, um, you know, we are in this, you know, unique um, you know, magical realist, um, you know, going on a year moment, uh, you know, uh, globally. Um, but it has forced upon us, you know, these, you know, hugely uh, bizarre uh, virtual interactions. But I am hugely grateful that, you know, I've come to know 
uh, someone uh, like Mary Taylor uh, much better than I, I would have uh, otherwise. Um, and, you know, uh, we were smitten the moment we tasted with her, um, you know, the first time that she got dragged along uh, for a trade business. But, you know, um, by the same token, you know, we've been uh, hugely lucky to deepen that re relationship. So uh, to that end, uh, cheers to you all uh, alone together. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> all right, Joe, what else do you have for us? Hmm. Last time you were on, Mary, you spoke about um, those 500 milliliter bottles for us, uh, <laughs> for us to, live, to live alone and, and maybe don't want to drink. It should, be, no, it, no, it should be said, um, this, is, this is a huge, so um, I was at home last night and my wife wasn't feeling as well. And uh, I brought home a bottle of uh, Tempia uh, Bando Blanc. And I was hugely excited because it was part of allocation and you know, I'm in a treat myself mode where stuff I wouldn't normally bring home. And, you know, it's, I mean, for those of you participating at home, it's probably like a $40, $50 bottle wholesale, which means that I'm costing the restaurant $40, $50 uh, for my own enjoyment. Apologies, any investors that are uh, listening as we speak, but um, it's stupidly good. And, and, and so, uh, and, and, and uh, Lulu, who, who, who's the, the matriarch of the estate just passed away. So it was like, a, it's a wine that I love. And, and anyway, um, uh, but, uh, I always leave. So I don't like the idea of finishing off a bottle myself. That feels like gauche. So I always, I always leave a glass, but it's like a pathetic glass in the bottle. And my wife always gives me a hard time for it. So I love this idea of a, uh, a more responsible single serving when it comes to uh, bottles of wine. Yeah, I'm getting really good at sucking back a full bottle. So. <laughs> not so great. So, um, yeah, the 500 mils would be super cool. <laughs> uh, it should be said, too, we have um, uh, um, Philippa Pato, um, who uh, is a, a friend of the restaurant. She makes um, uh, this uh, wine she calls Post Quercus, and she actually makes it in... Um, so she's married to this like larger than life Flemish dude and they make it in 500 milliliter bottles and one liter bottles. And she says uh, hers are the 500, 500 milliliters and her husband has the one liter bottles. I, I like the, I like the his and hers. Or, I mean, I don't want to gender that, you know, maybe, you know, there's a, a different relationship where, you know, you know, the husband, you know, drinks less than the wife. So, you know, say la vie. But uh, I think 500 milliliters is a good single uh, a more responsible single serving size. And I, I hope that people are, you know, maybe like in this moment more willing to embrace alternative formats. <laughs> oh, the cat. Uh, Zoe, what else do you have for us? What's your cat's name? Oh, she's far away. <laughs> <laughs> it's on mute. This is Ole. He, he, doesn't he doesn't help me drink the wine though. So that's a problem. You know, it does look like he has a cute little mustache, like a proper Frenchman. Yeah. <laughs> you give him, do you give him tastes of wine, Mary? I give my dog tastes of wine. Uh, he sort of, he doesn't hate it as much as he used to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, his mustache gets a lot of Hitler jokes. I, I hate to say it, but. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. We have a question about when you're working with the vintners with blending and how um, that relationship is and how much input you put in, how much input the vigneron puts in. And if you could just expand on that a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, I usually do this trip in March every year and I try to visit everyone and I bring like some sommeliers and I like to kind of bring people in for th that to feel a little agency around the project. Um, we were just there in March. That was the last trip I ever took. Um, and it's not, you know, I mean, they know, we have like certain rules, like never, never, ever aromatic yeast that I can't, you know, they know that I want things crunchy, natural, authentic, um, you know, just really like honest and pure. And they, we've had like deep conversations. So, you know, I kind of like, I'll go and like, we have lunch and we do some blending and we look at sort of like, you know, I tend to like a little bit higher acid and freshness than, you know, maybe they would expect, you know, I don't, um, I'm trying to pr protect Americans against the like Americanization of everything. Um, and we, I mean, we'll do a little blend, but if I can't make it that March or something, like it's no big deal. 
um, they know, and I leave them to do it. I mean, I pick people who understand their, their vines, their terroir, their geography, their winemaking, um, and they don't necessarily need me. I, I often, you know, to be honest, I don't always taste the vintage before I buy it. You know, I just trust them so much after year after year that I just know that they know um, what, you know, the wine should look like. And, you know, the longest relationship I have is, is in Bordeaux and I just buy the next vintage as soon as I need it um, without, you know, making them ship me a bottle or something like that. But yeah, I mean, the blending, is, it's kind of largely symbolic. Um, I'm not really on the ground. I'd love to go do a harvest. I'm thinking in Gayak because it's just so historic and funky and interesting there. Um, I haven't done a harvest in a really long time. I'm really like here and doing business here. So, and also harvest time is like the biggest time for an importer. You know, it's our, our big season is like a month before the distributor's big season. And it's a month before the retailer's big season. So right now, like I'm cooling down a little bit Whereas um, all of my clients are like hot, really, really hot. And so, you know, and you guys will be hot. I mean, you're probably really just killing it um, right Thank now. So. That's a great, thank you, Mary. That's a great segue. It should be said that for the uh, folks that are still in the mix, I did a terrible job shamelessly self-promoting. I promised Jill, my co-owner, that I would shamelessly self-promote the wine shop like at the outset, uh, but I, I didn't do that. But um, we're going to be open on Tuesday, uh, for those of you that are listening, uh, you know, within our bandwidth, um, which is to say that um, uh, by opening, I mean that I'll, I'll be here slinging wine. Uh, if you want to stop by during the day uh, for Thanksgiving, um, I'd love to help you find something uh, to go with, you know, whatever the hell uh, you happen to be eating uh, on, on Thursday. Uh, it has a Mary Taylor label. <laughs> <laughs> and we, 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 re-upped, we, we also re-upped on all the Mary Taylor, on all the Mary Taylor offered. Uh, it should be said, um, many of which, many, most of which are, are, are turkey friendly. Um, so, uh, and then if you're, you know, in DC proper and can't make it, uh, we're offering delivery on Wednesday uh, as well. So that's the, that's the shameless uh, plug portion uh, of our, of our program. Uh, but yeah, it, it, like, I don't think that wine exists at this intersection of multiple disciplines. And then, you know, when you love it, it exists, you know, and when you make a business out of it, it exists at the intersection of you know, something that you would do for free and something that you have to make money off of. Um, and, you know, you know, monetizing that passion is, uh, uh, you know, always, always problematic, <laughs> uh, I find. But, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can both find a way to do that, Mary. Uh, Zoe, what else do you have for us? I think that's about it in terms of questions, unless there's any last questions, if you want to pop them down in the chat right now. Uh, Groovy, so do you, do you have any, you know, final re reflections on this tasting having worked your way through the, the wines? I feel like you got short shrift uh, today for the first part of the, uh, the No, please. No, no, no. I would rather sit back and listen and learn from both of you's chat. Um, I, I'm just overwhelmed with Reyes's wines. I mean, the Vaucluse is still expensive, so is the Cote de Rhone, but it's certainly more affordable than Chateau Neuf de Pop, so that's where, that's where I'll be shopping for Christmas. Um, I really enjoy seeing Syrah in its many forms and particularly like looking at the different sapages and the different ways to look at wine. I found that it was a really instructive tasting through. Oh, um, we have a question. What are you drinking for Thanksgiving, Bill and Mary? Oh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say that first and then I'll, I'll let uh, Mary see us out with her uh, thoughts on, on Thanksgiving drinking. Um, uh, my answer is I don't know yet. Um, uh, I'm going over to my folks house because uh, we're my wife and I are in a pod with my parents and we could bring our dog over there but um honestly I, I I don't know I'm just looking forward to having a day off um uh I'll probably bring home some Beaujolais though because uh, I'm on I've been on a Beaujolais kick um uh and you know I don't know I'll try to bring stuff that my my mom and dad will like uh what does Thanksgiving hold and start for you Mary well so I come from a family that doesn't cook. We grew up on uh, McDonald's and canned pasta and terrible things. That's kind of what put me in the gourmet world. Um, so I have, I'll be doing the cooking and I have a bottle of Deutz champagne to start with. Oh, I yeah, love I mean, so good. And yeah. it's like, I found it for like $39.99 at a local place. So I had to buy a case. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'll do oh, the cooking. That is, uh, you just... 
So you just identified why my wife and I have separate finances. Uh, so that, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't not buy it. It was too good a deal. Right. Um, and my mom is kind of like a born again, like hates alcohol. So we, my dad and I kind of sneak our wine, but I don't know. I mean, my dad, he loves, um, but like maybe I'll do like a ripasso from the Veneto with the main course. I, it sort of depends. I love leading into dinner. Maybe in the spirit of the Southern Rhone, I'll do a Tevel Rosé. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know, maybe something like a Barbaresco or, you know, uh, maybe something a little cheaper because I'm, I'm not with a, a wine crowd per se. So uh, the Ripasto, the, there's some wines. I'm kind of in this Veneto kick right now. So I think, I mean, there's so much value there. And I'm actually looking for the ultimate Bartolino to do in the Mary Taylor lines. Ah. So don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, so I'm just kind of exploring maybe for white like a good lugana or for in my whites i just had my dow last night and i was like damn this wine got so beautiful it's so elegant it's a kind of a a, a shocking surprise because it, it got it, you know when wines kind of go like inward for a while like it didn't have a lot of there there like four the, months the ago dumb, was, the dumb phase the famous dumb phase dumb phase yeah it got dumb for a while and i was like oh like what i loved this wine in portugal like i don't know what happened but i opened it last night and it was su sublime like i was like oh my god i could slip this into a blind like white burgundy tasting or something like is that I, I what is the what is the doubt the Dow, it's a Encruzado, um, Goveo, Malvasia Fina, which gives it like the tiniest little popcorn-y kind of thing that, you know, some Portuguese whites have on the back. Um, yeah, it was just, I love Encruzado. I think it's a really, yeah. like, it's a great varietal. So if the people that cultivate it, and I have this like cool woman who has vineyards up three mountain, the Estrella mountain ranges, there's three ranges around her valley and I mean, she works so hard and I love her wines and, you know, they're, they're in my range. So I'm excited. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, and one thing I have to just say, and I've been preaching this to people is I don't believe in dessert wine. I don't think that sweet <laughs> wine is made for a dessert course. I, the other day at lunch, cause I was like feeling fabulous. I had um, a couple glasses of Sauterne with a little chicken liver mousse. And I was like in pure heaven. So if you're gonna drink a Sauterne or a, like, you know, a Vendage Tardive or something a little bit sweeter, I highly recommend pairing that with something fat and salty and, you know, entrance food, you know, and that's not like dessert wine. And please do not drink champagne after dinner. It is a pre-dinner drink as is, a, I think, a sweet wine or, or mid-course, but not after dinner. After dinner drinking is for, if you're going to have your cheese course, you, you're going to be drinking your reds, I believe. And after that, you can, maybe you can have a dessert, but you don't drink with dessert. You have like your tea or something, and then you can have your cognac or armagnac or calvados. What about tomorrow? Yeah, you can have it tomorrow after dinner, a digestif, okay. for sure. <laughs> I feel like there's it's a cool. very, very, yeah, I feel like there's a book deal here. Uh, yeah, maybe. Mary's George rules to drinking life. Yeah, exactly. Dessert and wine are never in the same sentence. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, let's toast to that. Cheers to you all. Thank you so much, Mary. Tell, 